Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lee Ham, Senior Vice President and Dean of the Tulane University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining the Tulane COVID Community Town Hall. Coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, has changed our lives and impacted our health. And unfortunately, this is true to a much greater extent in New Orleans than in many other parts of the U.S. The School of Medicine here at Tulane has a long and distinguished history of being on the forefront of combating emerging diseases in our region, the U.S., and beyond. Our commitment to an effort in combating the coronavirus pandemic is no exception. Tulane physicians and healthcare providers are on the front lines taking care of patients in our region who are infected with coronavirus. Tulane scientists are working around the clock to address not only the current, but also the future problems. Tonight, we've assembled four of those experts to share updated medical information demystify the science, and answer your questions as we continue our work to stop the spread and the negative impact of this virus. Now I'd like to turn the rest of the evening over to our moderator, Karen Courtney, Tulane VP for Government and Community Relations. Karen. Thanks, Lee. Um, so we're going to get started tonight with the panelists introducing themselves and taking just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about their work. So we're going to start first with uh, Dr. Bob Gary. Hi there. Uh, I'm Bob Gary. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology uh, at Tulane Medical School. Um, I'm a virologist that studies emerging uh, pathogens. Um, like the original SARS, I was back there and when that virus came out and um, it was just a matter of time before another um, coronavirus entered into the human population. So uh, in between that, uh, I've uh, done some work on Ebola and Lassa fever. And I think my main expertise is in viral proteins and uh, the immune responses to those proteins and developing countermeasures like diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, and even a vaccine or two. Lisa? Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Marici. I'm an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Tulane University School of Medicine. I'm also affiliated with the Tulane National Primate Research Center, one of our great resources of the university. Um, I am uh, mostly focused on vaccine development as well as uh, adjuvant biology. Um, and so it is, um, it is my uh, interest in, in developing new vaccines against both biodefense and emerging infectious diseases. Thanks. Greetings. Uh, my name is David Mushat. I am chief of the Tulane Adult Infectious Diseases section. <clears throat> I'm also the principal investigator for the Louisiana Community AIDS Research Program um, and have been involved in HIV research since 1989 when I came to New Orleans and Tulane as an infectious disease fellow and have um, you know, experience the HIV epidemic from the very beginning before we knew how to diagnose it or how to treat it through the present, uh, at which time it's a very manageable illness. And, you know, the COVID-19 um, epidemic reminds me in many ways of, of the HIV epidemic, except that um, it's compressed uh, to a very small amount of time um, over literally weeks to months compared to years that it took to, um, uh, to understand HIV. And I'm John Shefflin. I'm in the Department of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine. I'm uh, infectious disease in both of the departments. Um, most of my research has been focused on viral hemorrhagic fevers, working a lot with uh, Dr. Gary in West Africa on Lhasa and, and Ebola, mostly doing um, research on clinical care and pathophysiology and the natural history of disease. Uh, for the past uh, month, I've been doing a lot of work with infect control at Children's Hospital and helping set up policies and procedures for the LCMC system um, in this time when we're really short on PPE. Thank you. Um, Dr. Michette, I'm going to start with you because um, 
this question is really something I think is on everybody's mind is that we keep seeing the governor and the mayor and we see the number of cases continuing to increase. Um, and we're expecting that to continue to rise over the next couple of weeks. Can you tell us what the plan is for our critically ill patients at this point when we see capacity and also about ventilators and if we have enough of those? Really, uh, Sharon. Um, so, you know, I'm not a mathematical modeler, so I, I, and I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't think any of us knows for sure how this is gonna play out. But I think that it's prudent to assume the worst case scenario, namely that cases will increase, hospitalizations will go up and meet demand for intensive care services will continue to increase for the next uh, week or two before things plateau. Um, there are plans at different levels to address the increased volume, um, and it certainly starts at the level of the individual hospitals. All the hospitals in the area that I know of um, are making contingency plans to open up additional areas in their hospitals um, to congregate patients, sometimes multiple patients with the virus in the same room, um, creating more negative air pressure wards and rooms in the current spaces, etc. And in addition, the um, state is helping and the feds are helping by delivering uh, more ventilators um, to Louisiana and New Orleans so that we can ramp up the amount of um, intensive care that we provide uh, to our patients. In addition, um, the, the city and the state are um, going to open up the New Orleans Convention Center, uh, I believe this weekend, where hundreds of beds and ultimately, if needed, thousands of beds will be available to care for the less sick patients. Um, they are actually flying in or bringing in physicians, nurses, and other staff from other parts of the country that are not as hard hit to staff these, these, uh, this facility. And this will help to offload um, the hospital so that the hospitals can concentrate on the sickest patients who particularly require intensive care, uh, ventilator management, uh, and the like. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gary, you're our expert here today on sort of the origins of this virus and the science around it. So do we have any data yet on reinfection, either epidemiologically or in vitro? Well, I think that the reinfection question is uh, come up occasionally, and uh, there have been some anecdotal studies that have come out, you know, in the news media. I, I think it's likely that most of those reinfection cases were probably uh, false positive or false negative rather diagnoses in the first in the false positive uh, diagnoses in the first place uh, the patient was diagnosed with the illness but didn't really have it and then uh, a little bit later they came up or maybe got exposed and got infected uh, for real the second time so I think it's likely that uh, for the vast majority of people that have been infected with this virus that uh, they will develop some sort of immunity that will last for a while and probably protect them uh, from the most serious aspects of the disease if they get exposed again. Thank you. Dr. Marici, um, let's talk about vaccines for a second. Everyone talks about vaccines and how long it might take. Can you just give us a little bit of background on why a vaccine is important here and how it might work in this, in this instance? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we think a vaccine is going to be essential to perhaps stop the pandemic or prevent future reinfections with this circulating strain. You've heard Dr. Gary speak in the past about the possibility that this particular coronavirus will establish itself in the human population. And because we don't know yet what protective immunity looks like and whether people who are exposed will be fully protected uh, after they've been infected, there is a great pursuit for a vaccine that can be given to the population on a, on a global um, basis uh, to prevent reinfection or prevent infection with this coronavirus or one very similar to it. Thank you. Dr. Shefflin, um, we seem to be noticing more young people are contracting COVID-19. Is this something that's happening in reality and if so, why is it happening? That, that's a great question. So it seems that COVID-19 is really an adult disease. Um, we're not seeing a lot of pediatric cases in here in Louisiana. Um, I've been speaking to colleagues in, in Seattle and in New York City, and they're basically seeing the same thing. I think one of the reasons why we haven't 
picked up so many kids is they are getting infected and they just don't show symptoms. But because of the limitation we have in testing right now, we're actually at Children's Hospital holding back on testing them to save those reagents for our sicker adult population. So we're actually not looking for it in our pediatric population very frequently. So it's probably existing there, but kids just somehow for various reasons, um, either genetic or um, I'm sure Dr. Gary can talk a little bit about the ACE2 inhibitor, which the virus likes to bind to, that actually isn't um, present in, in pediatric um, respiratory tracts as it is in adult respiratory tracts. So I think the reason why we're seeing a few more cases now these days is that we're just doing a better job at testing more of the population. Well, Dr. Gary, since he mentioned you and he talked about something that I'm not familiar with, an ACE2 inhibitor, can you tell me what that is? <laughs> so this is like a debate, right? If I get <laughs> the name mentioned, then I, then I get a response. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's the, you know, the ACE, ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme present on a lot of different cells in your body, but uh, particularly in the respiratory tract. And so this virus uses that particular protein, not that it has anything to do with, with uh, angiotensin or regulating blood pressure or anything probably, but just because it's a convenient protein on the surface for the virus to bind to. The fact that kids might not have as much of it or it might be distributed a little differently uh, in a kid uh, may give them uh, some level of protection like uh, Dr. Shefflin mentioned. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mashat, um, what about randomized testing of mild asymptomatic individuals to help us better understand the extent of community spread? Well, it's a good good question, uh, Sharon, and um, certainly you know it, it's a it can, a consideration. I think that the the point I want to make right now is that we have significant limitations in the supply of the testing kits and the capacity to run these PCR tests, and so we really want to try to reserve them for the patients that have a greater need. So the people that are sick, the older patients, people with comorbidities, people um, get going into emergency rooms, getting admitted to the hospital, et cetera, I think take priority over um, you know, perhaps younger people that may be carriers. Um, certainly when more tests become available, that will be a more viable option. The other thing to keep in mind is that in the coming months, um, epidemiologists will be doing zero uh, prevalence uh, surveys. And what that simply means is that antibody tests, those are the chemicals that our body makes to fight off infections and that make us immune so that we don't get reinfected, will be measurable. Um, and they're already beginning to do that. And so it will be very feasible down the road to do surveys of populations, whether it's young people or whoever, and determine how many people actually were infected um, recently or more remotely and get a better sense as to how many people got infected. Now, there's estimates that anywhere from 20 to 60% of Americans, based on the Harvard modeling, uh, may become infected this, turn, this, this, this first time around. But we, it's hard to tell right now with the current PCR testing, because that's only picking up people with active infection who are, um, who are producing virus that's actually detectable on, on the current assays. Thank you. Let's go back to vaccine for a second, Dr. Marici. Um, I've heard people talk about a vaccine adjuvant, and you seem to do a lot of work with that. Can you tell us what that word, what that is, what it means? Yes, yeah, sure. So it, it's gotten a little bit of attention in, in the media recently, and, and most of the public is familiar with the concept of a vaccine because we, we all have gotten vaccines as, as kids, and we all give it to our children. But people are a little bit less familiar with the term adjuvant. An adjuvant is basically a substance that is put into the vaccine formulation to help induce some more robust immune response. And it's actually as critical a part of the vaccine formulation as the protective antigens themselves or the protective components that are put into the vaccine to mount an immune response to the, to the infection that you're trying to prevent or to the infectious organism. And uh, Tulane University has a longstanding history in adjuvant development. And um, it's one of our strengths and fortes here. And we hope to um, help uh, and do our part by, by studying the effect of adjuvants on these newer technologies that you've heard about in the news, these mRNA platforms and what have you. Um, we're not quite sure 
if the, if the immune response that they'll induce is robust enough on their own, and that's why these clinical trials are being done. Um, so Tulane has an opportunity to get involved um, with NIH funding and with our great resources at the Tulane National Primate Research Center, where we, we will have the models up and running in the very near future. Um, so we can actually study the vaccines that are being introduced to the, to the humans through clinical trials. We can adjuvant those vaccines and look and, and see if we're getting better immune responses, better antibodies, if you will, that can actually neutralize and prevent infection from this virus and see if we can get longer lasting immune responses that will last for many years to come. Um, these are all influenced by the adjuvant that is added to the vaccine formulation. And another really neat aspect about adjuvants is that they can dose spare. And what I mean by that is one of the uh, rate limiting steps in introducing a vaccine to the world is production. So going from a few vials to hundreds of millions of doses takes a great manufacturing capacity. And adjuvants can actually help you dose spare so that you don't have to produce as much vaccine because by adding an adjuvant to the vaccine, you can actually enhance the immune response to the vaccine. So we can distribute more vaccine by, and not have to make quite as much. Before we leave this topic, let's talk about the timeline for vaccines because we I read everything from 12 months to 18 months. We need it, you know, next week. So what's what's realistic? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and let's just say for the sake of our clinicians on the panel and on the front lines, what we really need are therapeutics to treat the critically ill. We need antivirals, we need other approaches that that can help sick people. But yes, in the long term, we're gonna need a vaccine. And, and I know the, the public is, is, is you know, looking for, for the vaccine in the next month. And that, that just isn't a reality. And you've heard, uh, you've heard Dr. Fauci from the NIH talk about you know, maybe a year and a half, maybe, maybe two years. That's a much more realistic uh, timeline and that's an optimistic timeline. And the reason for that is that the real rate limiting step, production being one, but the real rate limiting step with, with the introduction of a vaccine for public use are the clinical trials. So anytime a vaccine is introduced in human use, we have to go through phases in clinical trials. We're introduced to a small number of human volunteers and we make sure that vaccine is safe in those volunteers. And if we note that it's safe, then we move on to what's known as phase two, where we enroll hundreds of volunteers. And again, we make sure that vaccine is safe and we make sure that it's doing what it's intended to do. And that's inducing a really robust immune response that we think will protect people from disease. That phase two, well, let me tell you about phase one. Phase one typically takes about three months on average. Phase two typically takes six to eight months. If phase two is successful, the vaccine is moved to phase three. Again, we do this in phases for the safety of the volunteers in these clinical trials. Phase three is when you enroll thousands of individuals. And this is really when you determine efficacy of the vaccine. Can the vaccine protect people from the disease? Once we have all, and that typically takes six to eight months. So you can see we're already to a year and a half to two years with those three phases. Once we have the data from all of those phases, then the regulatory agencies will assess the data and then grant approval or not for that particular vaccine. So at the earliest, a vaccine that could be distributed for public use, or a licensed vaccine, we're looking at, the, at an optimistic year and a half to two years. Well, just so that we don't leave you with bad news, <laughs> those bad news, you do feel confident that we will get there, however. I do, and if you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have told you it's going to take us 10 to 15 years to produce a vaccine. Moderna, which is the, which is the company that just started phase one trials in Washington, they went from discovery of the vaccine platform to the phase one study in 63 days. That is phenomenal, and so, Thanks to recent scientific and technological advancements in vaccinology, the discovery phase and the development phase for the vaccine has been condensed. But we can't, um, we can't condense clinical trials. We can't risk the health and safety of our volunteers. We have to take our time 
and do those correctly and, and assess the data before the vaccine is approved for widespread use. Great, thank you. Um, so we're starting to get um, questions from our virtual audience. Uh, so Dr. Shifflin, uh, can COVID-19 be passed from a preg pregnant woman to a fetus or newborn? Oh, so that's a really good question. Um, so far, there have been some very limited data uh, about that. Um, the, we've been looking through all the published reports to try and find an answer to that question. So far, it does not seem that the, there's no evidence yet that the SARS virus can be passed from a mother to her unborn child. There have been a couple of case reports suggesting that infants can be exposed during delivery of the child, uh, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Um, so we're, we're keeping a really close eye on all our um, pregnant women here that come in COVID positive and most of the hospitals now have protocols to monitor closely those babies and test them at a regular intervals soon after they're born to make sure that they stay healthy. Thanks, thank you. Um, Dr. Geary, rumors are around um, that there's some new two-lane data showing six feet of social distancing is not sufficient. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> well, I'm not aware of any two-lane data. I do know that there are studies ongoing. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are studies uh, ongoing that, um, you know, are going to determine the efficacy of spread. I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind about this virus is, is that the R in its name, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, tells us that it's a respiratory virus. So I think, you know, there's, there's been, um, you know, a lot, some confusion about that. I mean, some of the experts on TV will tell you, well, it's not an aerosol. Well, I mean, that may be, you know, in a technical sense, uh, right, or it may be in a technical sense wrong. I mean, when you talk about aerosol, you usually talk about smaller droplets that can travel a slightly longer distance. But, you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind is, is that prime, the prime way this is spread is if you're uh, standing near or in the same space as a person with the disease and they cough or they sneeze, they'll create droplets. If you're in the pathway or in the area there, you will get exposed to those droplets and you know, you'll breathe them in, they'll land on your face or you'll touch them or touch the surface that they may have landed on and that's how you get infected. Now, this, the CDC actually from the very beginning has been telling us that, you know, the, the transmission from surfaces occurs but it's much less of a, a route of transmission than the um, than this aerosol route. So that's why I'm happy to see you know sort of a switch in the messaging from you know wash your hands 20 times a day to the social distancing messaging, which is uh, you know going to be the way that we're going to interrupt this uh, pandemic and and keep all our people safer in the long term. So we're not saying don't wash your hands. <laughs> No, most definitely not. Please do wash your hands. Uh, washing them 20 times a day may not, you know, make a whole lot of difference, though. Uh, Dr. Mashad, so this is a question I haven't seen before from one of our uh, audience members. Can facial hair be a means of transmission for the virus? Should I shave my beard and mustache? What about my fingernails? Should I keep them clipped short? Or can I keep getting weekly manicures? <laughs> well, Sure. Anything that, that is a perfect question for Dave, by the way. <laughs> Anything's possible given the unknowns here. I think that um, certainly um, I had a beard up until this whole thing started and I shaved it, but the reason I shaved it was just so that I could wear a uh, protective mask, an N95 or surgical mask. If you have facial hair, such as a beard and mustache, it's very hard to get a good seal and therefore you cannot um, rely on a mask in that setting um, if you have facial hair. Um, you know, there are people, I, I have a, a friend uh, who's been dealing with, uh, who was dealing with um, this uh, epidemic overseas, and, and he told me that we should all shave our hair and our heads and faces, and because the virus can stick to anything, clothes and hairs, and, uh, you know, that's, that's one point of view. I, um, I don't honestly know, but I think the key thing is you don't want it anywhere near your face, so it's, it's almost a moot point whether you got hair or not, you don't want to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. 
you can avoid it. And we all do that despite our best intentions. It's human nature. But particularly if you're, um, you know, uh, near other people, if you're near patients, you want to try to avoid that. Uh, you know, maintain good hygiene. Um, use, you know, wash your hands, you know, frequently. Soap and water for 20 seconds and or alcohol-based hand cleanser. I wouldn't get too um, obsessed with um, some of these things. Uh, it's, it's not time to shave off all our beards and hair at this point, uh, but if you have to wear a mask, yes, please um, don't wear a mask. Don't, don't rely on a mask if you have a uh, beard. Okay, good to know, but I also don't have to shave my head right now either. Um, I, I forgot to address the um, long nails and that sort of thing. Well, I mean, we do know that um, healthcare workers are not supposed to have um, long fingernails, um, for instance, nurses and others who are taking care of patients. I, I don't recall the, the precise the details, but I know that long fingernails are thought to perhaps um, be able to harbor microorganisms, um, especially if you're a healthcare worker and you're taking care of patients and maybe make it a little bit more difficult to decontaminate your hands when you wash them. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, it, you know, you shouldn't be getting close enough to people anyways. You shouldn't be shaking hands or any of that sort of thing um, uh, right now, you should be distancing yourself. So I, I think it may be a good point. Thank you. Dr. Marici, um, the question came in about whether or not we could use blood plasma from cured patients to protect people who've not gotten sick yet. Yes, so that's, that's a great question. And, and that is what is referred to as sort of passive immunization. Um, if you look back at the 1918 Spanish flu, it was used successfully in sick patients um, where basically you, you wait for a patient who's been infected um, with, with the virus in this case, and you, and, and you wait for them to recover. And then what you do is you look for evidence of neutralizing antibodies in their blood. And if they have those, then you can administer the sera or plasma of the, from the blood of those patients to, to critically ill patients. It's actually being... Um, looked at in New York where they're starting to do that for their critically ill. Um, I'm not aware, and maybe Dave can jump in here or John can jump in here and, and, and talk about this, but I'm not aware of it being used for healthy individuals to prevent infection currently, but it is being looked at um, for our critically ill. And um, it, does, it does hold great promise. Sorry, uh, Lisa, which, pro which agent is that? Just the use of convalescent plasma or sera to prevent coronavirus infection or to treat the critically ill. Right. I know the FDA uh, this week um, um, issued an emergency, um, 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 basically regulation allowing um, providers to obtain uh, convalescent sera from people who recovered from COVID-19 and give it to those who are very sick. We're certainly looking at that here in New Orleans. And collaboration with the blood center. Um, there have been some impressive responses to that. This is nothing new. This has been known for decades. Um, it's, it's certainly been, been used with Ebola and before antibiotics. Um, this was actually somewhat effective in treating people with various um, infections. And so, um, you know, obviously it's a somewhat cumbersome process. People have to go and, and undergo apheresis, have their blood removed and have the antibodies performed. It's expensive. Um, and there can be side effects, but it definitely um, is worth pursuing. Does anybody else have anything on that? No. Uh, well, sure. I mean, uh, the uh, I mean, the logical extension of using uh, passive antibodies is to make your own antibodies uh, if you can identify uh, in the. Um, survivors, you know, which of those antibodies are the most efficient, then you can clone those out uh, using modern techniques, uh, express them, express them to higher levels. And uh, those um, monoclonal antibody therapies are, you know, have proven to be very effective in Ebola. We've got some for elastic fever that work very well. And um, there are even uh, starting some trials of some uh, cloned antibodies for um, COVID-19. So uh, hopefully we'll get involved in those two here at Tulane. Yeah, I, th I think though there's a big difference between convalescent plasma and monoclonals. I think studies from, from you know, the Ebola outbreak 2013 to 16 showed that 
you know, convalescent plasma didn't show a lot of promise, but monoclonal antibody immunotherapy does show a lot of promise. So I think, you know, I'm not saying the trial shouldn't be done, but I think, um, you know, we have to, you know, we may not, the antibodies may be in there, but they may be, may not be in there in a sufficient concentration to make the convalescent plasma work. We just have to do a trial to see. This question is for um, Dr. Gary, Dr. Mashat. Um, uh, someone has, has told us that a China study showed blood type A at increased risk. risk. Are replication studies underway? Is there federal coordination of studies of risk to refine our understanding of higher risk groups? Maybe I'll toss that to Dr. Shefflin. I think he is uh, a much more knowledgeable on blood groups than I am. I have not heard about any of those studies. Uh, Dave, I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I think Dave already already typed in a comment about it's it's possible, but it's a little too early to to make some conclusions. I think what might be really interesting is that. Um, it just may uh, represent, if this is true, that certain that there are certain genetic types, for lack of a better word, that um, people have. We know that from from other diseases like Ebola, that there are certain genetic types that we could categorize that were more predictive of death than others. So this could be just, uh, you know symbolic of some genetic marker that we have to figure out, but it's going to take large studies and, you know, sequencing the entire human genome to figure these things out. Great. Thanks. Anybody else? Dr. Mushat, anybody? Great. So going back to Dr. Shifflin, if I'm exposed or think I may have been exposed to COVID-19, should I stop breastfeeding? Good question. So right now, the recommendation um, from pediatricians and the American Academy of Pediatrics is that as long as you are asymptomatic and healthy, you can continue breastfeeding. Um, we do recommend for women who are breastfeeding, if they have a high risk, you know, a, a significant exposure to a positive patient, they should wear a mask while breastfeeding. Um, but and once they become asymptomatic, they should stop breastfeeding, but can still continue to use expressed breast milk. Uh, the one exception to that is women who are COVID positive at the time of delivery. The current recommendation is that they um, don't breastfeed. They can still pump milk and give the baby expressed breast milk, but we still recommend that they should um, keep a significant distance, so at least six feet from between themselves and their newborn, which obviously is um, rather traumatic to do, but for a mother and a newborn infant, but that's the current recommendation. Uh, Dr. Marici, um, a recent Italian study showed double mortality in males versus females. Any thoughts on why men have higher mortality? And then to follow up on that, I know this isn't your expertise, but it is an area focused for one of your collaborators, Dr. McLaughlin. So we wondered if he had thought of, imparted any thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, I wish I could buzz Dr. McLaughlin in right now. Um, yeah, so from, Go to France. <laughs> from an immunological standpoint, men typically are more prone to infectious diseases. Um, however, you know, with it really may be also um, infection specific. So at times men may be more at risk due to occupation um, in this case, um, it could be that men are, have comorbidities uh, associated with more severe disease, such as hypertension and what have you. Um, so, um, but yes, that, that, that does, uh, that for infectious diseases in general, men typically do, um, do suffer um, from, from greater infection than females. Just some colleagues, does anybody know if men have more of the ACE2 receptors on their epithelial cells than women? Because that could be an explanation. I know. So Dr. Rochette, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on the front lines in New Orleans right now. 
Well, I mean, as everybody knows, we're, we're seeing increases in cases, um, you know, both uh, mild as well as symptomatic. Uh, I think that's no secret to anybody. Um, it's in the headlines. Um, and certainly the numbers of people um, in, in our hospitals uh, is, you know, it is extraordinary. You know, some of the hospitals in New Orleans, more than half of their patients are either proven COVID-19 patients or what we call PUIs, PUIs, or persons under investigation. Um, it's quite extraordinary. What's really interesting is the number of people with other diseases has gone down. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. We don't know what's happening to those people, but um, you know, certainly elective surgeries are down. There are some reasons to think that some complications and diseases may be, um, may be you know, a little bit less common right now due to the, um, you know, the fewer procedures that are being done in surgeries. On the other hand, there are many things such as other infectious diseases that happen whether there's um, you know, um, room in the hospital or not. So we are kind of concerned about what's going on with those. But bottom line is, yeah, it's, you know, we're getting busier. Um, we're putting, you know, having to get more ventilators. And then the problem is even if you have uh, adequate supply of ventilators, which we have right now, you have to have staffing. You have to have critical care or pulmonary specialists to manage those. You have to have nurses, respiratory therapists, all the sort of support staff, and we do not have an endless supply. And then of course, a very small number of our healthcare workers have had exposures and some have become sick. And so some people have to go home and quarantine or go into isolation. And so this is why Louisiana is um, you know, bringing in um, healthcare workers from outside to try to help um, you know, beef up the uh, support services. So, you know, it's a very busy time. It's, it's, it's there's a lot of um, complexity in these cases, um, a lot of stress. There are difficult decisions that may have to be made. Um, you know, we're not at the point yet where we have to put four people on a ventilator as they claim they may be doing in New York City. Somebody who's invented a device that allows two to four people to be on the same ventilator. I will say that the silver lining all this, if there is one, is the extraordinary ingenuity of people around the world, the creativity, the volunteerism, um, and the can-do attitude, which I think is going to um, really make a difference both with this epidemic and, and in the world as we move forward. I, I really am hoping this will be, you know, a paradigm for unprecedented cooperation, transparency, sharing of information and data uh, like the world has never seen. I want to follow up on that. And this question really is for any of you that want to take it. Um, so there's been a lot of what Stephanie Grace um, and the advocate today called Mardi Gras shaming. And of course, we have the second or third highest per capita in the country. Um, do we know why our numbers, does anybody want to venture again, you know, to talk about why you think our numbers are higher here than they are in other parts of the country? Uh, let, let me start that. I, I'm sure other people have, have thought about this, this issue too. I mean, the timing, you know, is uh, suspicious, but uh, we do know that we had cases before uh, Mardi Gras uh, occurred. So, um, the, you have to think back to some of the, the messaging that people were getting back there uh, when Mardi Gras was happening. Uh, the so-called experts on TV were talking about, you know, washing your hands uh, uh, 20 times a day and holding on to things with napkins on, while they're riding on subway cars with, you know, a lot of people. The notion of social distancing was not even really uh, in people's consciousness back in in mid to late February when, when the Mardi Gras season was here. So, I mean, I, you know, I, it occurred to me, yeah, well, maybe this is gonna be a problem, but, you know, I didn't, was standing up screaming on the street corner, shut this down. It was not, uh, not really, you know, what, what people were considering back then. So, um, you know, did it happen that way? Um, it's actually a testable hypothesis. Uh, we are going to be sequencing, uh, uh, COVID, uh, you know, the SARS coronavirus genomes. We're gonna see if, you know, there is any evidence that this is anything unlike other cities in the, in the country. I doubt it. I, I don't think we're gonna see a bunch of exotic strains from, uh, you know, from Italy or Germany or any of the other possible visitors that came to the city here. I think this is gonna, you know, that, that we got infected just like any other uh, large city in the US, you know, and I think we'll see the same sorts of, of patterns that'll that'll bear that out eventually. Anybody else want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I'll just add in that, you know, Southeast Louisiana has long been known for its um, high, you know, its relatively unhealthy population. We have a lot of kidney disease, a lot of chronic lung and heart disease here, a lot of obesity here. All of those, from what we've seen so far, are risk factors for severe COVID-19 disease. So we may just have more severely ill patients uh, than other communities because of these comorbidities. I would completely agree with that. We have such high rates of um, obesity, diabetes, hypertension is rampant. Um, and these are all you know, pretty well established risk factors. So I'm sure that plays a big role. So another question that's been, um, that comes up a lot is about the shortage of PPEs in the city. And of course, everyone wants to help participate. And so there's been a lot of talk about hand sewing of masks. Could, Dr. Mashak, can you talk a little bit about, about that and how effective they are? For one of my favorite topics, we've been um, you know, um, laboring over the, this issue for the last few days because there's been such a groundswell of support and interest from the community, be it medical students, um, friends, volunteers, all kinds of people out there are even, for instance, the, the Tulane uh, Theater Department um, has offered to put their costume designers uh, on this, um, this, this project of, of making uh, masks and things of, of that sort. Um, it's a very tricky issue. Um, I've learned more about masks and protective equipment than I ever knew as an infectious disease clinician, where I just grabbed whatever was available and I used it because it was certified by the United, by the OBIOSH or NIOSH. I've had to learn a lot about this. Um, I think the problem is that um, while we have certified and validated um, equipment, um, we don't know necessarily what the quality and the characteristics are of homemade, um, home-sewn uh, masks and equipment. It's very hard to exert quality control, and it's very hard to know what is the right thickness, the right size, is it the right fit? You know what? What about the material? There, you know, some N95 masks have a. They have. There's a, things called basically a, like a charge inside the fabric that traps some of these particles, and there's just no way that we can um, regulate this this industry um, if we have thousands of different people doing it. So, it, you know, we're very wary about using this. The CDC has said, and, and, and you know, as a last ditch effort, um, homemade masks. Um, would be acceptable. I, I think that where they may work the best is if we put them on patients who have or we think have the infection. I would not rely on them for healthcare workers because the likelihood of their being able to filter out the tiny droplet nuclei and aerosols is very small, both through the fabric, but also through entrainment or movement of air around the side of the mask where the fit is not necessarily very tight. But if you put a mask pretty much any kind of cloth or mask on somebody who's coughing and sneezing, that does a pretty good job of um, capturing the, the larger droplets um, that, that we expire or exhale um, that eventually turn into aerosols and droplets. It's not perfect, but that works pretty well. That's the basis for why surgeons wear surgical masks. They're not N95, they're not the high um, efficiency masks, they're regular surgical masks that surgeons wear so when they're over the patient's open uh, wound, um, they're not um, contaminating the field. And so therefore, you know, we, there's reason to believe that putting these on people that have the virus will help to, to reduce the spread. And so that may, may be a role for these masks, but we have to be very careful because if we encourage lots of people um, to use these masks, there is the risk that they will not use them properly. They will touch the outside um, during the course of the day, put them in their pocket, contaminate them, and then that may contaminate, then they may contaminate themselves. But if somebody coughs on the mask and you touch it then, and then you touch your, your eyes, nose, or mouth, you're gonna infect yourself. So it's a, it's a very um, sticky wicket for, for lack of a better term. So we're not saying that we have, people absolutely shouldn't be doing it, but it's not, it is a last resort for, for anyone. Right, I mean, I, I think the emphasis right now should be on um, trying to um, locate um, appropriate PPE or protective personal equipment. Um, the Tulane School of Medicine medical students have done a fantastic job this week. Uh, I think as of a few days ago, they had 
they had um, brought in over 3,000 uh, masks that they found. You know, these, these kinds of masks uh, are also used by industry. Um, industry has what's called an industrial N95 um, that is, by, has been, is now um, legal to use in healthcare uh, based on an FDA, I think it's an FDA or OSHA ruling. And there really isn't much of a difference between an industrial N95 and a medical N95. Very subtle differences. They both filter out the same kind of particles. And so um, I think students have, have been able to scrounge up all kinds of mask gowns, gloves, bleach, et cetera, from all over, whether it's you know marine supply companies, uh, factories, clinics that are, that are not operating, um, people's personal supplies, labs, you'd be amazed at how many places these things are squirreled away. And so it's really very gratifying to um, see what people can do when they, they work as a team and they, um, you know, um, and, and they uh, rise to the occasion. So this came in while you were talking. If you cover an N95 with a homemade mask, does it extend the life of the N95? Great question. Um, Hard to say. Now, it's probably not really necessary because we are reusing N95s. Number one, um, when masks get low as they are now, you no longer have to throw out the mask and put on a new one when you go to a new patient. You try to cohort people with the virus in the same part of the hospital, in the same ward. And when you do that, then nurses and doctors don't have to get rid of or, or change their PPE with every patient. So that does conserve it. Um, the other a very promising um, development is that many academic centers and hospitals are rolling out decontamination procedures. I'm very proud of the Tulane Primate Center and what they're doing. We're hoping that uh, on Monday um, they will be rolling out a hydrogen peroxide vapor decon decontamination process. And, and what will happen is masks will, are being um, deposited in collection areas within the hospitals. They will be brought um, to the primate center where they, where they will be essentially fumigated with a very high concentration hydrogen peroxide vapor that has been well demonstrated um, in previous studies um, done for the military and other uh, venues um, to um, inactivate uh, all sorts of bacteria, fungi, viruses without compromising the integrity and the function of the mask. You can't just Put these in an autoclave and, and or boil them or put bleach on them because if you do that you damage the mask and it doesn't it doesn't achieve its um, its goal it doesn't work or it's hard to breathe through but there's good data that hydrogen peroxide will will um, sterilize the mask and it will it will then evaporate and leave behind no damage allowing us to reuse the mask 20 to 30 times so i'm very excited about that in the coming days yeah, I'm really excited about that process. And I don't know, Dr. Marici, I know you're at the Primate Center. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, you know, I think this is being spearheaded by, by Angie Birnbaum, our Director of Biosafety, with the support of our Director out at the Primate Center, Dr. Rappaport. I just, I just can't say enough about those individuals and their efforts and, and really the entire staff of the, of the Office of Biosafety. Um, this, could, this could be a game changer. Um, and, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's a terrific asset that we have here at Tulane. Our experience with infectious diseases, some of the, some of the uh, emerging infectious diseases, um, they, they require a very high level of containment and biosafety procedures. And our facility is world-class when it comes to uh, those types of procedures and, and SOPs, standard operating procedures for working with, with um, biohazards. Um, and so we're able to, or they're able to, uh, transfer what, what they know for the research setting to the clinical setting and help our, our uh, healthcare providers who are on the front lines, which is, which is just terrific. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a game changer here in, in the city. Uh, Dr. Shiflin, we had a question. Um, would high risk individuals with kids be better off leaving the state to stay with family based on the current rates of infection in the city of New Orleans? Well, we, we don't recommend that high risk individuals leave the state that would be a little harsh, um, but we do we do recommend that they um, do a little more extreme measures for social distancing and even self quarantine themselves and keep them separate um, from anybody who might have been exposed. Or we do actually even you know we don't have a lot of data on children yet. We do recommend that um, people keep 
small children, especially symptomatic small children, away from the elderly people with um, any kind of chronic kidney conditions or heart conditions. Um, so yeah, they do need to take extra precautions. And I think that's why a lot of these um, nursing homes that have outbreaks have had so much trouble and why they are purposefully making their residents stay in their rooms to protect themselves. But I think um, sending everybody out of state is, is a little unreasonable and I'm not really sure there's a safe state to go to anymore. Right. Dr. Gary, we've heard that there is some in-house COVID testing now at Tulane that has a 24 hour turnaround. Is that true or just a rumor? Well, it's uh, not precisely true right now, but in a few days, uh, hopefully uh, early next week, it will uh, no longer be a rumor, but it will be true. So there's been an intense effort over the past, um, just a little more than a week, uh, maybe closing on 10 days by a lot of people that, um, you know, we'll have this uh, mounted up now. Um, the hospital um, also has uh, received um, within the past 24 hours some uh, new test kits. So they will be doing that testing in their lab too. So um, the situation about in-house testing, I think is, uh, is gonna change uh, really quickly now. So it, the, the answer today is it's still just a rumor. The answer on Monday, I think will be quite different. Great. And how many tests will we be able to do at that point? Well, the, the new kit that the, the hospital lab received uh, can do um, almost 200 tests at a time. And, you know, it can be run several times a day. Uh, the other in-house testing uh, has a little bit lower capacity, but, you know, depending on how it's staffed and how it's turned around, it could be about the same. Uh, substantial talking, capacity. Yeah. Since we're talking about testing, um, with the limits of testing that we currently have, where are we really knowing the true rate of infection or the percentage of our population that's infected? And that's for Dr. Gary or for anybody else who wants to, to weigh in on that. Um, okay. Um, so um, it's a little bit different time, type of testing that will get us to those answers. Uh, right now, the testing that's being done primarily is to, to see if you have the virus uh, in your in your in your system, if you have it in your respiratory tract, so the nasal swabs are taken, and a test called a, a PCR polymerase chain reaction test is done. Uh, that that test tells you if you're actively infected. Now, to get at the questions that you're asking, that that people are actually very interested in too, uh, is you know how many people in the community have been infected? Uh, was I a pa was I a case? Uh, you know, a few months ago that cold I had? Was that really um, COVID-19? Um, you know, am I, uh, if I'm sick, uh, can, am I well? Can I go back to work? Am I immune to this virus? That requires uh, different types of tests, which are uh, looking for those antibodies that I believe Dr. Marici mentioned and we've mentioned on this panel a couple of times. So there's ser serological tests. Um, and, you know, there are different companies. I mean, some of them are, you know, are from uh, China, they may be well, they may be good tests. I mean, China had the virus before we did, so they've had a few months extra to, to ramp up these tests. Um, and uh, so uh, there are some tests that the FDA is making available. I can't really vouch one way or the other for these tests. I mean, you know, there are investigators at Tulane, including in, in our lab, that are uh, looking at developing such serological testing. Uh, you know, it's, we're, you know, we're still, you know, several you know, weeks or even months away from getting those type of tests developed, but they'll be very useful too, uh, particularly for the public health and, and looking uh, back at, you know, where this virus was, how many apparent infections were there, um, you know, what was the penetrance of the virus into the population. All those are very important uh, questions that need to be addressed, but it's a kind of a different test than we're using now. Dr. Shiflin. Do we need to wipe our kids' snacks down with wipes or something similar and wash our produce with soap or cookies? Um, well, <laughs> we should always wipe our produce, or, you know, wash off our produce down because there are all kinds of things that are um, probably on them that we don't know, um, when we'd rather not know. Um, I don't think we need to, you know, put bleach on our kids' snacks. 
um, unless we want to discourage them from eating snacks and eat more vegetables. Um, but I, I, I think, no, the, the most important thing is, is not only washing your hands, as we've talked about a lot, but one of the other things that we tell people a lot, especially if there is somebody sick at home, is to really be um, cautious and about washing down your, what we refer to as high touch surfaces. So all those kitchen counters, the bathroom counters and sinks, those are all great places for somebody who is uh, sick and shedding the virus, may not even be sick, but still shedding the virus. They touch their face, they put their hands on the kitchen counter or the bathroom sink. So those surfaces, we do encourage people to clean thoroughly more frequently than they would otherwise. But I don't think we need to put bleach on the, the, you know, the goldfish and the peanut butter crackers. Fair enough. Um, um, Dr. Mashad, we, uh, since everyone's teleworking now, people are also using this opportunity to have work done around their house and different things. So are there any special rules about having uh, contractors or people doing, uh, working with you on your house, in the yards, like just keep regular social distancing rules or anything else? Well, I mean, this is an example. Um, two weeks ago when this whole thing really started to take off, um, I think it was that first day, it was a Friday when our cleaning people came in to do our weekly clean of the house. And I, well, they hadn't come. I told my wife before I went to work, I said, you know what? I think we should recommend that they stop cleaning our house and we should pay them for the next month and then we'll revisit the situation. I don't think it's fair to them or to the people uh, whose homes they're cleaning for them to be going from house to house because it could be spread. And, you know, as a physician, I think I can afford to help them out a little bit. I think we all need to help each other. It's, it's, a, it's a small sacrifice, but I think these are things we can do. So I would certainly, you know, I would probably defer, um, you know, non-urgent um, things like, you know, cleaning the house and, you know, probably repairs, maybe people working on the roof of your house, probably won't affect you, but I also worry about the contractors um, being close together. It's a tough, you know, it's a dilemma though, because they need, um, they need work. And, you know, unfortunately, um, many people do not have guaranteed paid sick leave, et cetera, um, if they're not working. And so I, you know, a part of me wants to support them. The other part of me is, you know, I, I want people to stay home. Um, but I would definitely defer things that are not urgent, um, um, that can wait a while, um, and just use, use good, good sense and, and try to help people out. Dr. Marici, I heard on the news that it's hard to study this virus because we don't have the right models yet. Um, what does that mean and what types of things uh, do you use to study the virus and make vaccines? And is the Primate Center working on that model? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll tackle this one and then and then I'll I'll pump it uh, uh, pump it over to Bob Gary to, to to add on to this. Um, so so for for every infectious disease, there there are um, usually standard models that um, that can be used to study the, the the disease because this is a relatively new disease. Um, there have been um, experts that have been assembled from around the world to look at different animals to to test and see what the virus. Um, can infect and cause disease in. Um, the, the, the goal is always to find the model that most closely mimics human disease so that we can then screen therapeutics and vaccines through that model. Um, I believe the models that are showing the disease um, to this particular coronavirus and, um, are, are the ferrets and, and the rhesus macaques. Um, at our Tulane National Primate Research Center, um, we have one of the largest, if not the largest, rhesus macaque colony in the United States. And of course, our, our veterinary medicine program, our pathology program, microbiologists and immunologists at the Tulane National Primate Research Center are well-versed in studying infectious agents in these macaque models. Um, and so we are actually um, leading, helping to lead the effort here in the United States to develop the rhesus macaque model here so that the, 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 the virus, um, basically these macaques can be exposed to the virus through a number of uh, different routes of inoculation um, with the idea of trying to establish that severe lung infection. And this will be a great resource 
um, not only to study the virus from a, from a basic science standpoint, but also to screen uh, therapeutics and vaccines and other immunomodulatory approaches or monoclonal antibodies, as, as we've talked about previously, through this model. Um, and this has really um, uh, uh, been, it's become a priority uh, for, for our, uh, our program out at the Primate Center to, to establish this model um, and to make it available uh, to all investigators and, and, and even industry manufacturers to screen um, you know, novel cures and therapies for this, for this disease. Um, well, I would also just add that um, we're also developing the other research tools that are that are needed to um, proceed with uh, the basic research as well as the clinical research. Um, the cell culture models are also important. You can screen a lot of uh, uh, drugs and diseases in there. You use uh, cell culture models to um, characterize the immune responses to the virus. Uh, and, um, you know, the clinical trials of, of some of the promising drugs are going to require that we are able to measure the patient's immune responses, uh, virus loads, I, I mean, in a very remarkable, uh, sh remarkably short period of time here. I mean, basically all those systems have been uh, been gotten up and running at, um, you know, at the medical school and at the primate center. So, I mean, it's, it's been a really remarkable thing to see that all this expertise uh, brought to bear in just a very short period of time. Thank you. Dr. Triplin, the internet says to have my kids regularly gargle with warm water and antiseptic to kill the virus. Is there any truth to that? There, I hate to say it, but there's probably no truth to that at all. I, I can honestly say that nobody's done any studies to see if that's effective, but um, they probably, to really get rid of the virus, they need to do a lot more than gargling. And um, so, no, I'm afraid that's probably not doing your children any good. Well, I'm going to follow up on that with you and Dr. Mashad about vaping and teens um, or adults either. So let's go with teens and adults. It's, does vaping make it worse or make you more susceptible? And is there any validity to concern that vaping may worsen um, the clinical trajectory in, um, for people, oh, sorry, I can't talk today, um, in teens or younger people who get COVID-19? Um, well, I'm a big proponent of vaping, especially among adolescents. I said vaping. Oh, vaping. I thought you said bathing. <laughs> yeah, yeah bathing is really important. Uh, okay, vaping sour, is, don't, don't take a bath. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to nominate John for all these <laughs> things. Because. Yeah, I, I can create all kinds of interesting comments. So, um, yeah, we do, you know, we do know that vaping, um, there's been, vaping has been in the press quite a bit. It's been associated uh, with lots of bad uh, lung disease, um, it's, it, it's not good. Yeah, we, uh, you know, as a, as a pediatrician, as an internist, as a father, uh, it should be strongly discouraged. Dr. Rashad, what about in adults, does it increase risk? Of vaping? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to probably find out that, that cigarette smoking very likely may increase risk. And of course, it's associated with emphysema and chronic lung disease, which clearly are put people at higher risk. I, I would be flabbergasted if vaping didn't have a similar effect. I mean, it's certainly, you know, I'm not sure we know yet exactly what exactly is causing the damage. Is it the vitamin E that's in some of these compounds? But, you know, clearly vaping was not tested, um, you know, for years by you know scientists in animals etc to make sure it was safe and so there's all sorts of unintended consequences when you roll things like this out and you know uh, you know it's, it's pretty clear that um other infectious diseases can be worse if you uh, or can be triggered by um, lung injury for instance if you get flu um, which damages your respiratory epithelia you're more likely to get community acquired pneumonia due to uh, pneumococcus or staph aureus and that's probably because the virus lays the foundation of it so it breaks the ice and so I, I would be absolutely flabbergasted if smoking was anything more it was anything but 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 uh, a risk factor and, and, and a promoter of, of risk. Dr. Mashad, 
you, you mentioned um, lung damage. And one of the things that I've heard is that um, the lung damage caused by COVID-19 might be permanent. Is that true? I don't think we know. It's way too early. And I, I really don't think we should be speculating um, as to what's going to happen. I, I, I think that, you know, certainly our critical care colleagues, people like Joe Lasky, uh, Karen Halverson, Josh Denson, and others um, know more about this than I do. Um, but, um, and, and there's a wealth of data, I'm sure, on the long-term effects of adult respiratory distress syndrome, better known as ARDS. I'm sure that they do have some uh, long-term um, complications. On the other hand, I'm a big believer in, in rehabilitation, pulmonary rehab, tincture of time. Um, you know, it's, it, you, you sure, when you leave the hospital, you, after, after surviving this, if you've had lung damage, you're going to be that you're going to have some compromised lung function, but does that mean that you won't recover in three months? I'm not so sure about that. And what if you get back to 80 or 95 percent? Is that going to really change your life? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I'm a big believer in hope and time, and I and I would not, uh, you know, count your chickens before the uh, egg hatches. Dr. Marici, I hear there's a SARS-1 vaccine. Is there any hope that this could help us against this particular virus? Yeah, so you know one of the one of the reasons that Moderna was able to to move their platform into phase one clinical trials so quickly is that we did have previous knowledge of of the coronavirus based on its similarity to the to the original um, SARS coronavirus, um, and so that particular uh, vaccine I think it took almost two years um, to introduce, um, and so. They do share a lot of similarities. Um, this, this really falls under Bob's area of expertise, um, but, it, but it revolves around this spike protein. And that seems to be the target for most of the vaccines that are being developed. And there does seem to be some cross reactivity between antibodies mounted to the first SARS virus and those mounted to this, this SARS-CoV-2, um, suggesting uh, the potential for um, you know, a cross protective vaccine where if we design the right type of vaccine to the right uh, a, a part of the virus, we might be able to protect against more than one coronavirus, coronavirus if, they, if they are similar enough and, and don't mutate. Um, Dr. Gary, would you, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I'll take that in, in a couple of different directions. I mean, I think um, one of the most instructive things about the original SARS, I mean, people are calling it SARS-1, SARS classic, I mean, you can call it whatever it is, is that, you know, when that um, epidemic uh, died down and there were only about 8,000 cases, uh, the interest, and by interest I mean the funding uh, for uh, methods to, uh, you know, to counteract that, the countermeasures died as well. I mean, people worked on it for a while, but the NIH funding dried up, other funding sources dried up, and so those efforts which were Print, which were, you know, very promising and, and, you know, even created some good countermeasures like that uh, pretty much fell on the wayside. And so, uh, you know, the knowledge didn't go away, you know, so we still know about those things. But I think the lesson from that is, is that we need to be prepared. We need to, you know, th there are lots of other coronaviruses out there um, in various species that, you know, are are poised to probably enter into the human population. So maybe this next time, you know, we won't wait for SARS-3, we'll be much better prepared uh, with ideas and, and ready to go with uh, vaccines, diagnostics, uh, you know, before we get hit with another worldwide pandemic. Uh, Dr. Smuchat and Shiflin, do we think anyone might be immune to this? And could we use them to help us find a cure? I, I can I can address that initially. Um, I, I'm almost certain there will people will be become immune to it. There's um, some data I think from a Chinese uh, group of scientists yesterday that shows a reassuringly robust um, neutralizing antibody response to the infection. And neutralizing antibodies are antibodies that we make um, when we get infected with a virus um, that help to kill or inactivate the virus and then um, uh, persist. Uh, for hopefully long periods of time to make us immune. Because that was one of the concerns is what would humans make, they have a good, a, you know, an appropriate immune response that is protective as uh, opposed to something that just maybe transiently helps clear the virus or no response at all. But it does appear based on, on this 
study, and there will be a lot more that there is a good response. So that you know, it certainly bodes well uh, for both people becoming immune for some period of time, as well as for prospects for development of um, vaccines. Um, I think you know that the questions that still need to be answered is how many people um, develop good responses, how long do they persist, um, how do we measure them? You know, there's you know there, there are IgM and IgG serologies that are out there. There's going to be some rapid 10 minute to 30 minute tests available in a few weeks. They actually were being shipped last week by one or two companies, but the FDA shut them down because it was premature. But they will be coming out. But my understanding is that you know it's not a simple science. Like there could be cross reactivity between some of these and other coronaviruses. You know, there's issues of sensitivity, specificity. Um, this is going to take some time, you know, to work out. I, you know, again, I go back to what I said earlier about HIV. It took years to figure out HIV. We're going to. I do believe that we're going to answer many of these questions and solve many of the dilemmas a heck of a lot faster than we did, you know, 20. Five, 30 years ago when we were dealing with um, initial HIV epidemic because we had better, much better molecular techniques, diagnostics, information sharing. It, it's just revolutionary. I'm also really interested and intrigued in the emerging um, use of um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, neural circuits. You're starting to see it coming out of China. Um, one group has already looked at um, analyzing thousands of CT scans in patients. And they've achieved about an 80% uh, accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. It's not great, but it's getting into the ballpark where I think that AI will eventually, in the near term, will allow um, doctors and other providers to um, uh, more accurately analyze um, patients' symptoms, their, their um, x-rays, their labs. And this is just un un unprecedented. It, it, it's really... Um, you know, it's really very exciting, um, and I would hope that it, this uh, pans out. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, one thing that may make some of this complicated is that there are four coronaviruses that wrote, that um, are seasonal and, and circulate every winter, and kids get them all the time. It's a very common, um, it causes the common cold, and it, they're very common. They're probably genetically different enough that tests won't cross react with them, but you know it's going to depend on the test and we'll have to, to see if we can tell the difference. Okay. So uh, Britt, I'm going to ask a question and sort of go to each of you and start with Dr. Gary. What keeps you up at night <laughs> about this particular virus? <laughs> Actually, very specific. <laughs> Okay, let me uh, rethink that for a second. But um, I, I we're we're at the uh, in uh, particularly in Louisiana. I mean, we we've, we've had a pretty rough week this last week. I, I'm I'm really uh, concerned that the next week is is going to get even rougher, and then the week after that may well be you know where you know where things are are getting you know really stressing the system a lot uh, you couldn't have a better group of people than the the two line physicians and scientists that you know that we've all mentioned here uh, at the primate center and otherwise at the two line hospital you know getting ready for this uh but um you know the the next week uh a couple of weeks i think uh, you know the news isn't going to get a whole lot better uh and in fact you know it might 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 even get worse. Um, we're as well prepared here as we're going to be, um, and we'll all be pr pulling together to, uh, you know, to to help out, you know, especially those people that are most uh, severely affected. Uh, but uh, you know, I, we may be on a bit of a rough ride. Dr. Marici. Well, obviously, what keeps me what 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 keeps me up at night is is. is for those I love the most and, and for our people on the front lines. Um, but I also, you know, I worry about, about the future as well. I mean, SARS and MERS were, were early warnings. And, um, you know, as Bob pointed out, we, we should have known. Um, you know, infectious disease experts have been telling us all along that we're overdue for, for another pandemic. And um, I think overall, you know, people are doing their best, but... Um, but the response has been slow and, and, and inadequate at times. And, and we need to reinvest in public health and we need to reinvest in medical countermeasures 
uh, and, and be ready for the next one. Um, we got to get through this one first, but we, we have to be ready for the next one too. Dr. Mishat. I, I think what I worry, what bothers me most, uh, worries me most at night is, is uh, what's going to happen to um, our colleagues, friends, patients. Um, I've already lost one clinic patient. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's really tough. Um, and I, you know, and it's, you know, it's in many ways, it's, it's worse than Hurricane Katrina, which I, I went through and many of us went through here where it was sort of an over and done with thing. I mean, granted that the hurricane only lasted a few hours and then, the, you know, there was misery for weeks or months after, but at least it was sort of maximal effect and then it hosted for a bit, um, but this is going on and it's the persistence, it's the intensity um, and the, you know, the constant exposure of um, everybody, particularly healthcare workers, so that that worries me. And then like Lisa, you know, I worry about, you know, next fall, next winter, will we be ready? I'm, I'm pretty confident we will have much better diagnostics. We'll almost certainly have some idea as to what old drugs may work and may even have an inkling as to which new drugs may be useful, the vaccine won't be ready, but we'll have, we'll understand the virus better. So I think we'll be better armed to protect our society, our patients and healthcare workers. Um, so there, you know, that on, on the bright side, I, I think we'll be in better shape. Yeah, so certainly um, everything, I'll, I'll just echo everybody else's sent sentiments. Um, I think one of the, the things I know Dr. Gary can relate to this is, both of us spend a lot of time in West Africa during the, the Ebola outbreak, and there were there have always been very limited resources there, and um, they've never been prepared to handle a large-scale outbreak of any kind, and have been very reliant on outside resources to to get them through. It it's really um, it's really a, a surreal experience to you know have that happen in my own home. You know, we, we always feel lucky to, to be able to come back to the United States where we don't have to worry about limited medical resources, but that's now what I do about 18 hours a day is wonder about, do we have enough PPE? Do we have enough beds and ventilators? And it's, um, it's just a totally new world that we're living in now. Um, but I, you know, just as a, as a, as a, to end on a happy note, uh, one of the things I'll, I'll say is I think this is, you know, there's a lot of potential opportunity here. Um, I think this could really change the practice of medicine. All of us are, you know, learning how to do telemedicine. This could really turn out to be a good thing for us and make medical care more efficient and cost effective. Um, maybe it's time we stopped using so many disposable plastic gowns to see our patients. There are actually good alternatives. Um, so this may really change how we do things, hopefully for the better. Well, since you talked about a positive note, I didn't want to end on what keeps you up at night. Um, so I kind of wanted to also sort of circle back around and say, what is the thing that gives you the most hope um, at this point? Um, since I started with Dr. Gary last time, I'll reverse that and start with Dr. Shifflin again this time and go backwards. <laughs> um, just what I, what I just said. Um, I, I think also the other the other thing I'll just add is that it's it's been really inspiring to be you know part of this team right now, and not only the you know the, the the panelists that are here and the research team, but I've you know I like I said I'm a Tulane faculty. I've been working at Children's really. Um, we've been going there for about a year. I've really um, have not been going there very frequently, but they sort of tapped me to help lead their, their ID and infection control response a few weeks ago. It's been an amazing team to work with. And not only the children's and two lane teams there, but it's the whole, you know, the whole LCMC system. And we're helping out all these hospitals across the system. We're talking to our colleagues at Tulane and Oxner on a very regular basis. So I think it's really brought this whole community together in a really positive, productive way. Dr. Bichat? Well, I think I, I touched on at the end, I, I, ended, I ended on the high note and I, and I said that um, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm convinced that this is going to transform 
um, medicine um, in the world, in particularly in the United States. I've never seen so much collaboration, rapid sharing of data, preprint servers where you can get an idea that somebody has some idea somewhere before it's even been peer reviewed. Yes, there are pitfalls to that, but I've never seen a you know, free journal, uh, free articles on journals um, for everybody to read, sharing of um, scientific data, um, protocols. It, it's just absolutely unprecedented. And I, I think if we if we do it right, and we approach this, you know, uh, properly in the coming months and years, this will transform medicine. Um, in, in addition, the you know this is a great opportunity for us to really ramp up artificial intelligence, as Eric Topol is so articulately um, stated in his in his book, um, to help us you know figure out um, what are the patterns that are, that are out there that we, that humans can't appreciate. Um, looking at thousands, tens of thousands of patients, AI is perfectly poised to help with this. And I also in, in, in a in a, in a sort of a you know a, um, offhanded way, I, I, I'm wondering if maybe this will bring people more together. Maybe this will break down some of the barriers between you know the tribalism. Um, you know, uh, obviously it's not going to affect the psychopaths in society, but um, I do believe that perhaps you know some of the world's uh, you know, problems, whether it's you know, inter-religious strife or tribal you know, ethnic warfare, maybe you know, this will have a, a positive effect on that as, as more and more people realize we're all in this together on the same planet. We all are, this is an existential threat. There's no time to be fighting uh, each other. The only hope is that we work together and we, you know, join and, and we appreciate our common humanity as we move forward. I think that this could be um, a big, big, um, you know, sort of transformative step if, if, if people um, get on the bandwagon. That's that hashtag, apart together. Um, uh, Dr. Marici. Yeah, just to follow up on what Dave said, you know, for those of us who were here after Hurricane Katrina, I mean, the community was so much nicer to each other. Everybody was, we all felt a, a, a common, uh, you know, bond that, that we had been through something and, and it really put life in perspective. And um, and so what gives me hope is, is, is the generosity and the, uh, and the kindness, kindness of others in our community. Um, I mean, you know, Drew Brees just gave $5 million to Louisiana. How great is that? And, and you know, I'm sure others will step forward as well. Um, and, and also what gives me hope is the, is the creativity of our educators who are finding amazing ways to keep inspiring our students um, and, and, and the creativity of our, our scientists and our clinicians um, who are who are you know constantly battling this this virus and trying to come up with new ways to to protect everyone? So, so I do have hope uh, that we'll get through this together and, um, and 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 look to a brighter future. Dr. Gary, <laughs> um, so we will get through this. I mean, I think that um, and and John Shefflin mentioned the the West African Ebola experience. I mean. Yeah, that's 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 something that you know constantly um, you know comes back to my mind reliving some of those um, you know some of those really down days and and some of the serious consequences of that. I mean, I, this is not that. I mean, I think uh, that's one important thing. We we are there are a lot of there are going to be a lot of unnecessary people deaths. Uh, that's inevitable. I mean, uh, I think that we will um, learn you know, better ways as this moves through to do that social distancing and to, to help protect uh, the older citizens that are at most risk for this, um, this disease. I mean, there's, there's way too high mor mortality in people that have, you know, they're a little bit older and then have, have the compromises that, that Dr. Mushat talked about before. So, you know, it's, you know, we've, we've had a, had a hard time so far. We will definitely get through this though. There will be a, you know, there will be an end to this. It, it may not be this summer, it may not be this fall, uh, but you know, then there may well be a second wave of cases and things, but eventually these countermeasures, all these, uh, you know, very good responses to uh, keeping this virus down and learning how to better diagnose this, better treat it, you know, hopefully at some point uh, prevent it with a vaccine, those will, all, those will all work. So we'll get through this and, you know, some of the things that were mentioned like, you know, better use of AI, better use of telemedicine, you know, and, and probably most importantly of all, just, you know, 
learning how to interact better with people, each other, and, and, and stop this thing. Well, that was the last question I had, but I want to turn to you guys to see if you have any final thoughts um, you want to share, just if anybody wants to, um, things people should think about, know about. Anybody? Keep staying home if you can, and wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I generally say is, you know, uh, short-term pain, long-term gain. We need to sacrifice. We need to do that. Americans are used to having things their way. They're used to having lots of, you know, leisure activities, um, you know, enjoying each other's company, particularly here in New Orleans. It's a very sociable environment. We, we have to suspend that for right now. It's worth it. We do that for a relatively short period of time. In a month or two, we will reap the benefits. But if we don't do it, we will pay dearly. So please stay home, camp out at home, lie low, um, enjoy the outdoors, you know, get outside, sit outside and read, do your work outside. You know, but, but please don't congregate. This is the best way to mitigate this, ep to mitigate this epidemic. Yep. Yeah, do the social distancing as best you can. Um, it will be over. Uh, I would say don't obsess on things like, you know, don't watch that stock market that's gyrating up and down and, you know, all your stocks and bonds and things that are losing all their value. Just ignore it. It's going to, it's, it'll come back. It will. I mean, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, yes. Do what, do what Dave just said, you know, uh, interact with your family and friends, but at a distance and, uh, you know, um, you know, do all you can to, uh, to help your, uh, you know, your fellow human beings here in this very, very serious situation. And last but certainly not least, thanks to all of our healthcare providers who put their lives on the line every day to save those who are, who are at risk of dying. Dean Ham, do you want have any closing remarks? I think you're muted. Yeah. So uh, I want to thank the panelists uh, for sharing their expertise. Um, you know, these uh, panelists uh, all, uh, um, you know, they, they put in uh, full, they're putting in extra full days uh, already. And uh, uh, they've all been very gracious with their time too in sharing uh, with the public. So it's a, it's a real honor to work among these um, experts and, and the variety of others working on this. Uh, we're glad the, the, the people listening are out there paying attention because paying attention to the scientists and the experts is what we need to do. So thank you. So I don't think we got to everybody's questions, but we'll probably, if we think we'll do more town halls like this. Um, so uh, we'll get to your questions hopefully um, in the next one. Um, I would like to close by saying the thing that gives me hope is all of you and the work that you guys do because um, knowing you all are out there makes me sleep a little better at night. So uh, thanks for joining us for our online town hall and we hope to see you next time. All right. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.